England, a peaceful land known for its quaint villages and green rolling hills. It is here eyewitnesses claim to see a monster-sized feline beast prowling the countryside and mutilating livestock. A monster called the Beast of Exmoor. Must have been size of a Labrador, maybe a little bit bigger. Very lithe and smooth looking in its movement with a long looping tail. It was black, pointed ears, uh, scraggly, didn't smell too good. It had a large head, a long loopy tail and it was huge. It had round ears and a tail which curved up at the end. We don't know what it is. Uh, there's no cuts of that description anywhere in the world. Most eyewitnesses describe a large black feline looking creature with a body up to seven feet long and a thick tail that dips away from its body. Its ears are small and rounded and the torso is muscular and swift. Millions of years ago, the forests and moors of the British Isles were home to a variety of predatory cats, including jaguars, pumas, and the infamous saber-toothed tiger. What's quite interesting and very poorly known is that Britain uh, in the geological past had a really diverse, really interesting assemblage of cat species. Dr. Darren Nash is an archaeological paleontologist at the University of Portsmouth, located along England's south coast. Nash is an expert in prehistoric cats, as well as the native animals. We know that until um, just a few tens of thousands of years ago, we know that we had uh, leopards, uh, lions, uh, lynxes. Lynxes survived here until very recently. So we know without doubt from radiocarbon dated specimens that they were still here as recently as the uh, 6th or 7th century. But scientists say the last of these predatory cats, the leopard, died out in England over 10,000 years ago. Nace says there is only one native predatory cat in England today. Well, we only have one uh, definite native, and that is an animal that we often call the Scottish wild cat, and it is restricted entirely to the Scottish Highlands. Previously, it occurred across the whole of Britain, but today it's, today it's very rare. However, at only four feet long and having a tricolored coat, the Scottish wild cat does not fit the eyewitness descriptions of a black cat nearly twice that size. And Nace says that an undiscovered species is not likely. It's almost impossible to take seriously the idea that a mid or large sized mammal might exist undiscovered in the British Isles. Still, the reports continue, with well over 200 sightings in 2007 alone. Livestock maulings throughout the area continue to be a concern. Could there be another explanation? In the 1960s and 70s, large exotic cats were a symbol of prestige and kept as pets without regulation. People used to keep cats in this country, leopards, cheetahs, and you didn't need a license. As the director of the research group British Big Cat Society, Mark Fraser investigates and records reports of big cat sightings and is an expert on the history of predatory cats in Britain. In 1976, the British government passed legislation that made owning predatory cats illegal without a costly license. Rather than comply, some big cat owners freed their dangerous pets. We've only had three people admitting to actually releasing cats in the British countryside. And it wasn't actually illegal to release them then until 1981, because that was a loophole in the law. After 1981, it became illegal. The question is, how many cats were released without anyone knowing? Could these released killer felines be responsible for Britain's predatory cat sightings? Scott Lope is the director of operations at Big Cat Rescue in Tampa, Florida. With more than a decade of experience caring for and observing big cats, Lope is an expert in cat behavior. And I just can't imagine a population surviving that long or even a, a, a captive population that's turned loose either intentionally or escapees of, of being able to establish a population. Well, when I'm asked as, as a cat expert how, these, how they've managed to survive this long undetected or without a body ever turning up, that's, that's, therein lies my biggest doubt that these cats are actually here. You know, they're not going to just kill one sheep every few months. They're the big predator. They're going to roam around. They're going to kill things. Something has been leaving behind a grisly trail of mutilated livestock in Exmoor. For more than two months now, a mysterious animal has stalked the fields that fringe Exmoor in North Devon. So far, it's killed 80 young sheep and escaped all attempts to trap and kill it. In the early 80s, the region of Exmoor experienced a rash of over 200 mutilated farm animals. 
at the present time is only attack sheep, but when you see the savagery of the killing of the sheep, um, it makes you wonder what's going to happen if children are in its way. One farmer lost over 100 sheep, claiming that their necks had been violently slashed. With fear gripping the locals, the Ministry of Agriculture dispatched Royal Marine sharpshooters to the area to try to kill whatever it was. Did you hear that? Yeah, hedge line, about 200 yards. Named Operation Beastie, the Royal Marine sharpshooters dispersed into the village and surrounding hills, scouring the area's fields and pastures, searching for the creature. The attacks on livestock stopped while the Marines were in Exmoor and resumed soon after they left, but not before one Marine spied the beast. Looked pretty powerful. So as far as I can see, you know, I, I couldn't, couldn't tell you what, what it were, what species it is or anything like that. Not yet, anyway, it's too far away. And since that time, there has been a steady increase in the number of encounters. Sightings range from the barren moors of southwest England to the isolated hills of northern Scotland, each claiming its own infamous beast. Photos allegedly of the beast have surfaced over the years, but none are clear enough to be conclusive. This image, taken in 1988, shows an apparently large cat in Cornwall on England's southwest coast. This picture, taken in Devon, shows a four-legged, seemingly cat-like animal. And this image, taken in 1995 in Durham, North England, shows a black feline. Witnesses claim it was the size of an Alsatian dog. But the evidence is not just photographic. Viewers are warned that what they are about to see may be graphic. Within the woods of southwest England, just outside Nailsworth, Gloucestershire, another freshly oh, yeah, mutilated yeah. carcass has been discovered. Over there. We were just walking along the cycle track and we came over and saw it in the field. Gail Cook turned to local naturalist Frank Tunbridge for help. She wants to know if, in fact, a big cat could be responsible for killing the deer. But, uh, it was like All the this, skin yeah. had been peeled off. It, yeah, it was really quite weird. clinically. Yeah. From the way an animal is torn apart to the size and location of puncture wounds, clues at a kill site can be very revealing. Still quite fresh, actually, after so many days. Remind you, it was quite cold weather. That's amazing. The amount of flesh and blood on the carcass initially suggests to Tunbridge that this may not be a big cat kill. Then he finds what he's looking for, a large puncture wound. See that hole there? The fang's gone in. There. Puncture mark. And there's one on the other side. It's got it right up behind the horns, behind the top of the neck there, you see. According to experts, there are two main ways a large predatory feline kills its prey. The cat either breaks its victim's neck by violently biting into its flesh and bones, or by suffocating the animal, placing its mouth over the nose and mouth of the prey. And there's blood still. See, it's caused that deep damage, look. See, the blood's, the blood is still around there. After examining the carcass, Tunbridge is convinced that this is a cat kill, since the only other predator, dogs, do not kill deer in this manner. Dogs are, are known, especially big lurchers, to kill roe deer. But the way they kill it is chase it, and they go for their bite, the back legs, yes. to drag it down. Tunbridge confirms Cook's suspicions. She believes she and her husband saw the animal that may be responsible for the killing just several months before. We were out for a walk uh, one January morning, similar weather to today. We were walking down the road, which is just behind me, me and my wife, uh, just looking around for the wildlife, deer, etc. Just glanced over to the left-hand side of me and, and we just saw this big black cat. The cooks were astounded by the size of the beast that stood just 100 yards away. Just could not believe the size of it. It was enormous. It must have been the size of a Labrador, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, the, the tail was probably about 18 inches long and it was quite a round, thick, bushy tail. And it, it was just amazing to actually see it and it was just stalking around in the bushes there. The animal, distracted by something in the bushes, 
was unaware of the cooks at first. Just sort of moving around in the undergrowth and that, and they just spotted us, we had eye contact with us, and it just sat bolt upright and it was just staring us in the eyes. It was just staring us out. We thought it's going to run off at any moment, but it didn't. It just stayed there and stared at us. The animal decided the cooks weren't a threat and crept off into the bushes. You hear these stories and to think that it was sort of quite local was a bit of a shot, really. Just a massive, big black cat. The cooks aren't the only ones with chilling encounters with the cat. Stroud Gloucestershire had over 30 big cat sightings in 2007. And with evidence of the recent deer kill found by Gail Cook only 15 miles away, it is here the team will mount their search. Scottish amateur cat researcher Mark Fraser has assembled an international team of experts to conduct a search of the countryside for signs of a big cat. Fraser has recruited Scott Lope of Big Cat Rescue in Tampa, Florida. People are, are, are definitely seeing something, and it all seems to point to, or all the descriptions match a large feline. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what it is. And joining them, John Finch, a tracker from South Africa who has more than 30 years' experience specializing in hunting and tracking animals all over the world. We're all on this expedition is to assist the Scottish Big Cat Society and British Big Cat Society in looking at uh, trails and signs on the ground and so on. Okay, guys, thanks. The trio meets for the first time on a cold and wet day. With hunting illegal in England, the team must enter the forest without the protection of firearms. Fraser is relying on Finch's superior tracking skills and Lope's extensive knowledge of predatory cats to locate the creature without putting themselves in danger. It's what we need in this country, the experts. It's coming from the other countries who have been dealing with cats all their lives. It was like uh, tracking these cats and they can tell us just what's what. With their gear prepped, the team begins their hike. But as the expedition team begins their search, there may already be evidence that predatory cats exist in England. Legends and myths about a strange creature on the English moors have endured for centuries. Even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle chronicled one such beast in the Sherlock Holmes story, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Several people had seen a creature on the moor which corresponds to the Baskerville demon and which could not possibly be any animal known to science. They all agreed it was a huge creature, luminous, ghastly, and spectral. But skeptics say these stories are rooted in fiction rather than fact. We certainly see a number of people who do make false reports. Chris Moiser is a biologist who owns the Tropicaria Animal and Adventure Park in Somerset, England. I interviewed a witness the other day and I could almost tell you which textbook he described the movement from. He'd read the movement of the animal, he then comes and tells me he's seen the animal moving in this way. Moiser suggests that a lot of people want to believe in the beast, but he thinks the creature may be simply a rural legend. But then how do you explain this video shot in 1994? Mm. William Rooker spotted the enormous black cat on his land in Cambridgeshire, England, 75 miles north of London. Well, I'd been up the field and was burning up a lot of rubbish, and I'd got the camera up there to pick up uh, bird sounds, and, and uh, I saw an animal come out that I'd not seen before. When I saw the creature, I didn't recognise it, and therefore it, was surpri it surprised me and uh, I couldn't understand where it had come from and how it had got down there. Even the skeptics are swayed by this footage. This piece of film has been seen on several occasions by myself and many other researchers and is probably one of the best pieces of film available in, in, in the UK. It quite clearly shows uh, a large black cat moving across a field Whilst there are not size references present, the height of the animal in relation to the height of the greenery in the pasture is suggestive of a big cat rather than a domestic cat. So whilst not conclusive, it is fairly good evidence. Could this video offer any clues in determining the mysterious creature's true identity? Monster Quest will put it to the test. The analysis software that I use is very powerful. It allows me to do several things. 
Video expert Peter Schmitz of Minnesota-based Motion Engineering has received a copy of Rook's video and is in the process of enhancing it. In this case, ability to zoom in, to enhance imagery, to brighten, to draw out different things that are important. That an expert in CATS can look at this information with the changes that have been made to the video and determine what kind of animal it is that we're looking at. Joining him is Tammy Quist, a big cat expert with the Wild Cat Sanctuary in Sandstone, Minnesota. I've been in the business about 12 years, um, been doing a lot of identification work, legal work. Um, we have over 100 residents here, but we've rescued over 300 wild cats, ranging from cougars to lynx to black jaguars to black leopards. Once Schmitz completes his video enhancements, Quist believes she can determine the species of cat in Rooker's video based on its shape and stride. While this video is compelling, this man says he has evidence that is proof predatory cats live in the United Kingdom. With all the information I've got and all the field evidence, I certainly believe there are many large cats at Rome in the UK. Jonathan McGowan is a naturalist from Bournemouth on England's south coast. He's followed the big cat controversy for 20 years. The eyewitness accounts of which we get over 2,000 a year and the field evidence still suggests that the cats are there and living and breeding in the UK. For the past two decades, McGowan has collected hundreds of hair and feces from sites where people claim to see the beast and has agreed to supply Monster Quest with samples for further testing. I hope the DNA testing will prove at least one different species of cat actually lives and are breeding in the UK. McGowan has selected five hair and two feces samples to be tested by one of the leading wildlife genetic analysis services in Europe. Wildlife DNA services, part of Tepnell Life Sciences in Edinburgh, Scotland. DNA will be extracted from the samples and matched to a database in order to identify the originating species. Meanwhile, the Monster Quest team is forging into England's wilder side, searching for further evidence of predatory cats. If the beast of Exmoor is anything like known species of big cats, Scott Lope says there is no question that it could survive here. They're very adaptable. The tigers, the leopards, are, they have such widespread ranges. So they exist in the tropics and then into where it's very cold, very, uh, very snowy, miserable weather climate. So it's entirely possible. This is a, a climate that many different species of cats could adapt to very easily. In addition to the climate, Lope says diet is not an issue. From what we've seen just in scouting around, there's plenty of prey animals here. There's plenty of animals that, that, that easily could make a dinner for a leopard or some sort of wild cat. While habitat factors here will support a large cat, the team still needs hard evidence to prove its presence. Finch's job is to find tracks and signs of the big feline. And the main way to do this is actually look down on the ground and look for imprints that the feet make on soft soil or soft mud and then judge from that what species of animal has actually walked up or down that uh, pathway or, or game trail. But could proof already exist that the beast of Exmoor roams England's forests? DNA results in Scotland may hold a clue. Fantastically exciting to find uh, something that's been a legend in the UK for the last 20 years or so. For decades, people have claimed to see a monster black cat roaming the English countryside, a creature many say is responsible for grisly attacks on livestock and wildlife. For some people, those encounters have come dangerously close. Frank Tunbridge considers himself lucky after his brush with the beast back in 2005. I was walking along one day and um, I often come to this area where there's um, lots of wildlife and found lots of deer slots, which are deer tracks, in the, in the, dry, in the dust, um, going down to a pool. Now, I found superimposed over the top of these deer tracks, um, big cat tracks. I, at the time, searched around and I was walking over this bridge with uh, like a viaduct with uh, tunnels underneath um, tr following these tracks and then I was stopped in my tracks by a, 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 a 
noise of a big cat. Tunbridge believes the coughs were a warning that he was getting too close. Grunting or coughing is a form of communication that experts say predatory cats use to stake out their territory. I actually froze and felt all my hair stand on end. Uh, I know all the animal sounds. As I said, I've been into nat naturalist for years, the foxes and, the, and, and such like. Um, it couldn't have been anything else. So I went over to the side of the bridge where some railings and uh, banged the railings with the stick iron. And with that, I heard a rush through the dried up stream bed opposite. And I ran over, I could see the rushes moving and some large animal moving close to the ground to get away. The elusiveness of these animals is what makes their existence so difficult to prove. However, there may be physical evidence. Dr. Rob Ogden has been a scientist at Wildlife DNA Services for eight years. He will be performing DNA analysis on samples obtained from sites where people have claimed to encounter these predatory creatures. Dr. Ogden will perform a four-step test to isolate the sample DNA and attempt to match it to the DNA of a known animal. Then he will make copies of a particular sequence within the DNA that will help him identify which species it comes from. To do this we use a process called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, uh, and this allows us to target this gene and make millions of copies of, of the same sequence area. The final steps include replicating the DNA sequence and then trying for a match with Wildlife DNA Service's extensive database. While Ogden knows that working with blood and tissue samples may provide a more definitive result, he is confident the hairs will yield an answer. If you've got a, a lab with the right kind of expertise to work on these samples, you'd normally expect to get a species identification maybe 90% of the time. Meanwhile, in southwest England, a monster quest expedition is underway to try to find fresh evidence of the beast's existence. Mark Fraser, John Finch and Scott Lowe are scouring the forest searching for signs of a predatory cat's presence. The techniques I'm going to be using on this expedition is looking for any sign of... The sign is basically tracks, uh, places where they have scats, where they do tree marking, and basic evidence of if something large, i.e. a big cat or some species like that, has actually been in the area. Finch leads the team through the wooded enclave and investigates the grasslands near available water sources. In Finch's experience, this is the most likely area where he will find tracks. While following a wildlife trail, the team finds a well-traveled trail crossing. With no tracks evident, they implement a secondary measure to capture proof of their prey. This looks like a promising place, Scott. All these paths and trails converge on this one spot. Excellent place for a camera trap, which we will... Uh, Put the camera here. Under there. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll move over here. And we'll put cat-specific lures on this tree over here, and that one over there. What excites me about setting the trap strategically in this location, it's a, it's a really good crossing. If there is a big cat, and this mysterious creature always seems to be identified as a large black cat, and of course they move around after dark, and, and after dark, you know, a, a lot of animals look black, so it may not be a, a black cat at all, but what, I think what we're going to find out for sure is what is traveling these trails, and hopefully have some photographic proof. So if anything comes through you, whatever time of day, you've got a, a proper photographic record of the species and the actual time that it actually passes along this trail. To up their chances of capturing the beast on camera, John Finch will set up cat attractants in the area. Uh, one of the main reasons why I use uh, Bobcat Band Lure is it's a tried and tested lure that's used internationally in the jungles of Peru to all in uh, jaguars, in Africa for leopards and red lynx and African wildcat. The lure is scent that has been extracted from the gland of a bobcat. Bobcats are territorial in nature and the scent of another cat generally elicits an investigation. With the camera trap set and the attractants in place, the team leaves the area to continue their search for tracks and signs of the beast. Only two miles from the trailhead, the team finds their first large track, and it's in good condition. And it's really nice to go out off to the rain, because it actually helps me as a, a tracker, that from yesterday or the day before, or the week before, everything's obliterated, and everything is now fresh. The tracks prove the trail is well used, but 
In this case, the track is from a badger, not a cat. This is a good Only 22 miles away from the Monster Quest expedition, another paw print was discovered in 2006 near Cold Ashton in Wiltshire. This print may provide the evidence needed to prove predatory cats live in England. A cast of the print will be subjected to expert scrutiny. Found by Madeline Sparks and her children, the paw print was unlike anything they'd seen before. There was a patch of mud after some rain and um, there was a very clear print and I didn't want them to be too disappointed because I was a bit sceptical about the possibility of, of being a big cat. But the thing that struck us all was the size of it, it was enormous. So we happened to have some plaster at home. So we all went home and got some plaster and made a cast. Then just a few weeks after finding the paw print, 10-year-old Faith Sparks had an encounter that convinced the family that a big cat was in their neighborhood. I happened to wake up in the middle of the night around 2.30 and I peered out the window and then there was this black panther head and it walked past the window. It was about maybe a foot and a half high and it, it was quite long and it had round ears and a tail which curved up at the end. I was very excited when I saw it because I hadn't seen a cat so big before. And then I got up and told Mum. She leaned out the window to try and get a picture of it. But it was too dark and Madeline Sparks was unable to get a picture. The cast of the paw print would be their only proof. This young man says he has proof of another kind that points to the paw of a giant cat and has the scars to prove it. The English countryside is awash with reports of a monster black cat roaming the moors, terrifying all it encounters. While sightings of the beast stretch across the United Kingdom, there have been few attacks on humans. This young man claims to be one of them. When it first scratched me, I didn't feel much at all, just shock. In 2000, Josh Hopkins was 11 years old when he claims he was attacked by a large black cat while walking on a farm road in Trelec, 75 miles north of Exmoor. I could see a tail in the grass. Um, I approached it. The look of the tail was waving above the two-foot grass. Um, the animal was probably just over three foot high. Um, probably five foot long. The cat styled as I was. The attack was swift and frightening. I screamed really loudly, which startled the cat to run away, and I ran the other. Rosemary Hopkins says her son Josh is lucky to be alive. The 11-year-old was attacked near his home on Wednesday. He said, Mum, Mum, a cat's had me. And I thought, well, a cat couldn't do that, because I was thinking of a domestic cat. And he said, no, Mum, it was a big cat. It was as big as a dog. Police are normally very sceptical about the many reports they receive of big cat sightings. But they're taking the incident that happened in this field very seriously indeed. But big cat expert Scott Lope knows the hallmarks of a large cat attack. He questions whether Hopkins' injuries support his claim. Well, when you talk about or hear about folks being attacked by, by these beasts, you really, as someone who works with these cats and, and sees the kind of damage they can do, and usually when, when it's a verifiable attack, it ends in someone being seriously maimed or, or, or killed. An examination of the photos of Hopkins' injuries supports Lope's initial impression. Minor facial scratches, not consistent with the, with the width of, of the toes or the claws of a large wildcat, and definitely the injuries of a bigger wildcat grabbing someone's face would be much more severe and, and, and more of a, a deep punctured gash, a tearing, not just simple slices. So I would uh, seriously doubt that this was inflicted by a cat or any, anything other than maybe a domestic cat. While the Hopkins account is one of the few reported attacks on humans, the sheer number of sightings of the creature has prompted something rare in cryptozoology. The local police department regards the sightings as having merit, and they have developed a plan for dealing with the creature. It's called Operation Black Cat. 
Mark Robson is an environmental and wildlife crimes officer with the Gloucestershire Constabulary. A decade ago, his department created a contingency plan should the beast be a danger to the public. It has to be a, a confirmed site, um, and in, someone obviously keeping a close eye on, on the actual animal itself. And we would go through a list of calling people out, uh, relevant agencies, and including someone experienced enough to um, dart the cat. It would not be our intention um, and it is not our intention to shoot the cat unless it was a danger to um, the officers and or any other public at the time. For Robson, the presence of the beast is far more than speculation. Within Gloucestershire, um, we believe we've got at least um, two black leopards um, wandering about um, through the county. There has been sightings of um, lynx um, over to the east of the county, but never many, more than one or two um, per year. But mainly um, black leopards is, is what we believe we've got. But quality evidence of the cat's existence is rare. They will see you before you see them, really. So chances of actually seeing and getting a good shot of them in, in the wild is, is going to be limited. With hard evidence continuing to be elusive, skeptics doubt eyewitness descriptions, pointing out that the beast is often seen at a great distance, where visual acuity is at its weakest. With so binoculars, uh, they are just looking at a naked eye sighting, which may be only a fleeting glimpse of about three to ten seconds, which uh, isn't easy. Trevor Beer is a naturalist and author of several books on the Exmoor legend. He has a simple experiment to test eyewitness accounts. In the experiment, the idea is to place some hardboard cutouts of big cats at 50 foot and 100 foot distances to gauge what people who have never seen cats in the wild themselves before will see and think they see um, here in the field. This exercise will test eyewitnesses' ability to judge size, color, and species. Fittingly, it takes place in the beast's own backyard. We're right on the edge of the Exmoor National Park. We're right bang in where the Exmoor beast has been seen and recorded down here for the last 25 years. Trevor Beer will work with Danny Reynolds to create life-sized replicas of large cats. Reynolds is an avid animal enthusiast and has been the curator of Exmoor Zoo since 1993. With the cutouts, uh, we're looking at what prospectively could be the Exmoor beast. We've got a number of selection of species involved. Uh, we've got jungle cat, we've got lynx, we've got uh, leopard, and we've got puma. One of the cutouts is the size of a typical black leopard or puma, two feet at the shoulders and four to four and a half feet long. Another cutout is the size of an ordinary domestic cat. Some of the cutouts are tan colored to test if the color of the creature affects the perceived size. I think potentially the black silhouette may appear a lot bigger if you follow me and more dominant in people's mind than the actual browns and the tans. I've got a feeling they're going to lose them into the camouflage. Well, it is very difficult to gauge size unless you've got something nearby to be a useful comparison. With the observation test prepared, the team heads off to find participants. Witness reactions are recorded as they glance at the cat cutouts from 50, 100, and 150 feet away for just five seconds. One, two, three, four seconds, and five, and turn away again. Well, what do you think you saw? Black cat. A black cat. Of what sort of size would you have said? About five feet long. About five feet long. Okay. You say I would have put it smaller. I would have put it as a kind of medium-sized dog. Medium-sized dog. Well, that's pretty good, actually. That's that's very fair. Well, when we turned around, I didn't know what I was going to see, but as, as soon as we turned around, it was obvious it was a cat. Um, the size was fairly obvious. Um, you know, it, it was very clear. Distance didn't seem to matter at all because um, the thing still looked roughly the same size. On this day, every subject was able to accurately judge size and color. It suggests that under conditions similar to many of the sightings, people can tell the difference between a little cat and a big cat, even at a distance. And repeatedly, people report they are seeing very big cats. The experiment this afternoon showed that uh, 
50 feet, 100 feet, 150 feet and so on, uh, both large and small cats. And they, they were always recognised exactly for what they were and I, I'm really delighted. The silhouette experiment that we, that we just took place, uh, very intrigued. Um, it was interesting to see that the people were actually able to distinguish between shape, size and colour. And I really didn't expect that. It makes me think perhaps you know, there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. In Sandstone, Minnesota, Monster Quest has teamed up with video expert Peter Schmitz and founder of the Wildcat Sanctuary, Tammy Quist. With Schmitz's video enhancements complete, Quist begins her species analysis. But what's interesting, what I see in this film is what I've seen with stills and a lot of others, is we, what we talk about the geometry, the linear of the lines, the distance is similar to so many other photographs and film that are sent for us to try and identify. I'm trying to look at both perspectives. I'm looking at it once as a domestic and once as if I thought it was wild. What is it showing? That tail is so long. Interesting. That's very interesting. The, the curvature of the tail is the questionable part for me. This is very rough footage to see, but the curvature of the tail compared to a domestic because what it looks like here is there's a hook. A long tail with a hook is a hallmark of big cats like panthers. But there is another clue. To me, the, the biggest key note to me is the posture of the animal's movement of how up and down the posture of the running is. For several decades, a mysterious black cat has been haunting people and killing animals throughout England. History has documented the beast going on a killing spree, and then as quickly and mysteriously as it began, disappearing again, able to elude even a search by armed marines. This man encountered the beast in the woods. This family made a cast of a paw that they believe was left by a puma. And this man says he was attacked by a big cat when he was 11 years old. This man captured a video of a giant cat on his property. But can the size of the animal be determined without any objects of known size in the camera's field of view? Cat expert Tammy Quist has watched the video and has come to a conclusion. Wild cats, if you're talking jaguars or leopards, as they would cross this, their back barely would move. I mean, they have wide gates, very smooth even when they're running. If you took a video from the front, you would see the face and you'd see the back almost stay linear versus the hopping motion of this animal. On one hand, the gait suggests a smaller cat, possibly domestic. But what about that exceptionally long tail? The only characteristic that I see that's questionable of a big cat versus small cat characteristic is how long this tail is. But I've seen domestic cats with a long curvy tail like that too. If I had to put my money on wild or domestic, to me this is a domestic cat that has some questionable features like the tail. And again, it's hard to know if the tail is, ex is longer or if the cat is thinner and has been a feral cat and might be thin. British big cat researcher Mark Fraser, South African tracker John Finch, and American cat expert Scott Loeb have journeyed deep into the forest that has been a hub for many recent monster cat sightings. The tracking expedition has uncovered many animal tracks, but none so far of large cats. We've also found small deer. We found a uh, failure to a weasel, which is a very small track, approximately this big. And we found fish fox tracks, we found fish uh, moonjack tracks, and we've also found badger tracks. It's hoped the trail cameras will have photographed the beast. Let's go see what we got. The camera confirms something did visit their camera location, a badger. Possibly the same animal whose track Finch found earlier. While the expedition team did not find any big cat tracks, what of the paw print that the Sparks family cast? Looking at the, the print in the photo here, um, I have a leopard print and I have a jaguar print. I don't have a mountain lion print. But the other thing that we see a lot in the cat paw prints is the shape of the toes are not nearly just as round as what you see the impression here. They tend to be more elongated, um, as well as you tend to see sharp 
impression here and here. What we have here is a great Pyrenees. So this is not, this is a domesticated dog. Um, you can see that the toes are much more rounded the impression versus longer and oval. Um, the shape of the, the pad itself is much more similar to what we see here. Um, so in my opinion, this is from the canine family, not the feline family, these prints. The most compelling new evidence might be the fresh deer kill found by Gail Cook. Researcher Frank Tunbridge believes he found fresh puncture wounds to the head of the deer. Clear evidence pointing to a big cat kill. All the hall marks do point to a big cat killing. Um, the puncture marks are damaged around the neck, the broken neck. Um, the ribs actually um, bitten away around where the viscera is, the liver and, uh, and the kidneys, etc., which they go for first of all. Um, all these hall marks point to a big cat killing. To test Tunbridge's theory, Monster Quest sent the deer carcass footage to several experts, including biologist Chris Moiser. I have no doubt there may be puncture wounds in the throat. There's very little congealed blood there, which I would have expected had an animal been pulled down by a large predator when alive. Paleontologist Dr. Darren Nash takes a different view of the kill. We can see the skin has been peeled back, which indicates that this is a, a cat kill. Dogs don't really do that. So, based on the evidence that we can see here, I, I would tend to conclude that this most likely is a cat kill, but it's difficult to be sure without actually seeing the carcass myself. While analysis of the carcass proved inconclusive, the most accurate tests may be the DNA. MonsterQuest gathered the best hair and fecal matter evidence from field researcher Jonathan McGowan to be put to the test. If the hair that I've sent out is analysed and proven to be big cat hair, then that will basically mean that all my work isn't in vain, and it will certainly show the sceptics that they certainly do exist. In Edinburgh, Scotland, Dr. Rob Ogden of Wildlife DNA Services has the results. For the two fecal samples, we didn't get a result. We couldn't get any DNA from them. But for the hair samples, we got results on four of the five. The first one came back as a seeker deer. The second one was a red deer. The third sample came back as a dog, common domestic dog. And the fourth sample was a pig, but I'm afraid no big cat. In this case, no cat DNA was discovered. But Ogden is still excited by the mystery. To find something like a big cat, um, yeah, it would be exciting results. But for the man who has spent years collecting hair and feces samples, suspecting they came from predatory cats, the hair analysis and DNA results are disappointing. Jonathan McGowan had hoped that a positive result might finally give amateur researchers like himself the credit they deserve. I would like all the hundreds of people that have been working on the big cat phenomenon for the last 50 years to be given an all clear from the major scientific bodies or the government bodies in accepting that they are here and that we're not loonies, that we really do know our wildlife. But for now, the mystery surrounding the beast of Exmoor is alive. And as long as the sightings and killings continue, the search will go on. My search for the Exmoor beast will continue uh, on into the future. I've got no idea of stopping. We're always going to be there to listen to people, listen to reports and follow up the reports and uh, with genuine sympathetic ears. And we'll always be there until we've actually solved the, uh, the mystery, yeah. Some people say that the cat is not out there. Um, I have the scars to prove that they are. <laughs>